Welcome, dear friends, to uh, today's uh, devotional, long-form devotional, as we're going to discuss the second item in the inventory of the armor of God as presented by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. Yesterday, we discussed the uh, the first one, which is the belt of truth. Today, it's the breastplate of righteousness. And before I get into that and get into the uh, PowerPoint that I created for it, I want to remind you that for the Greek, for the Jews, the heart of a person wasn't um, so much a physiological thing, and it wasn't entirely about emotion, as a lot of people believe that it's how the Greeks spoke about it and, and other cultures. For the Hebrews, the human heart, when they re, when they mention it in Scripture, when they talk about it in God's Word, it is that place within oneself where the intellect and the emotions combine to make that person who they truly are. So when the scriptures say something like David had a heart for the Lord, it meant that David's entire persona, his intellect, his emotions, everything about him was oriented towards God. And the breastplate is of righteousness is to be used to protect that heart that integrity of the person. That's what God is providing it for. I'm going to share uh, my uh, screen with my PowerPoint, and we'll get into looking at what righteousness means a bit in Scripture. We certainly can't go over all of it. And we're going to take that and apply it to how it works as part of the armor of God. And I've actually begun this already. So what I'm going to do is back up to the beginning and uh, take us right to here. So this is the part that we're that we're uh, talking about now. This is uh, from Ephesians 6, uh, verses 10 to 14b. Stand therefore, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And you notice yesterday I talked a bit about how the belt of truth was fastened. This is a putting on. This is an acquiring. This is a receiving and putting on. It's not fixing everything together. And, and because it's the kind of language that's used in this, in the, in the Greek, as Paul writes it, suggests that you are receiving something from God, from his armor, and you are to place it on yourself. It's not something that you built is something that he built. And in the language reminds us about that as uh, we read through the passage. Now, I, there's a lot of different images you can get for a Roman soldier's breastplate or armor. <clears throat> Pardon me. And, and it does, it's obvious through archaeological finds and other things that Roman breastplates, Roman armor went through a series of evolutions as the Roman army became more and more sophisticated. What we see here is something that would have been mid-Roman, probably mid-Roman uh, or early Roman conquest time, around the time of Christ. The original breastplates may have only been hardened and multi multi-layered leather, and those might still have been used for very, very junior people, uh, you know, some of the, as you advanced, you got better armor. So this would be something more that on the lines of what uh, someone who at least had a platoon that they were responsible for. And it, it was made out of these plates that moved so that the person wearing it had a bit of ability to move. And still the belt could be fastened around it to hold it in place should any of it sort of come loose. Uh, later on, and you may have seen images, it looks like a solid breastplate that's been, you know, almost fitted or formed to the person. Those are very ornamental. And, and although they did exist, that would have been later on. And those would have only been for those of the most high rank, completely bespoke and made exactly to their body shape and body type. 
But for the, for the purposes of our illustration, this is a completely surrounding breastplate. It protects the shoulders, it uh, protects the torso, it protects the abdomen, protects you from the back, but it still allows movement. And that's the kind of breastplate that I very much think Paul had in mind when he wrote this passage in the letter to the Ephesians. And I think it was very much the breastplate that people would recognize and would have been thinking about in their minds as Paul gave us this illustration. Now, the word righteousness is what hangs on this. I mean, we understand what a breastplate is. We understand what it's for from a military standpoint, from an armament standpoint. But it's the breastplate of righteousness. It's not the breastplate of steel or the breastplate of chain mail or the, the breastplate of gold. It's the breastplate of righteousness. So we have to look into that word. And as I told you, one of the best ways to start to get an idea of what Scripture means when it uses certain words is to do a word study. So I've done a word study on righteousness, and it appears 272 times in the ESV translation of the Bible. And that's pretty close to the number of times that it appears in the original languages. And there's really only one word used in the Greek, and there's really only one word used in the Hebrew and variations on those words. It really is only one word. Covers a semantic domain with meaning everything from what is right and good and proper to a person who is upright, to upright thoughts, upright deeds, upright actions, things that are that are righteous before God. One of the things that we talked about when we did this in our study is what does righteousness mean today? And I think I think righteousness isn't talked about very openly in our culture these days because a righteous person in a outlaw motorcycle gang has a much different ethos than a righteous person, say, in a political party or a righteous person who works for the uh, police department or a righteous person who is part of a charity organization. I think righteousness uh, can be applied and twisted and turned to mean all sorts of different things. What we want to focus on, because we're we're doing this from a biblical standpoint, and as disciples, we want to know what righteousness means in God's word, which is why we're going to do this short word study today. Now, it appears a lot. 272 times is a pretty high word count, uh, and that means that righteousness... Uh, at the word itself and the idea itself is a important idea in the word of God. It's in uh, the Bible 187 times in the Old Testament. And interestingly enough, there were three, there's two books that appears in more at times than any else and 59 times in the Psalms, often describing the character of God or the desire for the psalmist to be righteous before God. And it's, just, it's in 48 times in Isaiah, again, often referring to God or referring to the Messiah, because Isaiah's uh, got several prophecies about the Messiah. The word righteousness in the Greek appears 86 times in the New Testament uh, and 31 times in Romans, which is not surprising, seeing as how Romans is Paul's treatise on what makes a person right before God. Is it the law or is it grace? Is it God who makes us righteous or is it what we do that makes us righteous? And that's something to bear in mind as we move forward in this. Now, I haven't done uh, 272 word studies here. I have taken specific a few specific ones from the Old Testament and the New Testament that I think are indicative of the main ideas involved. So let's go to the first one. And this one is Genesis 15, verse 6. So fairly early in the, the word. And he, this is Abraham, believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. The he being the Lord and him being Abraham. This passage is repeated at least once. I believe it's repeated twice in the New Testament because this is the foundational way that righteousness works before God. It only works when there's a relationship with the living God. 
Moreover, it only works when there's a positive relationship with the living God. In this case, Abraham believing in the word of God, believing in his promises, believing that what he has promised to him, he will deliver. So right away, right out of the gate, righteousness has everything to do with God and everything to do with our relationship with God. And this is one of the key passages that defines that for us. Now we look at this one from 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 8. And this is, of course, this is about David. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on his throne as king before the Lord your God. Because your God loved Israel and would establish them forever, he has made you king over them that you may execute justice and righteousness. So very, also a big theme about righteousness in the Old Testament is that the king, the representative of God, the king of Israel, who is to reflect God, is to execute justice and righteousness. Not only are they to be righteous people, but righteousness is a thing to be done. It's not an abstract idea. It is a physical reality about how just and right and true and proper things should be. And the king, uh, God's king, is expected to act this way. And later, as Christ comes along, it's said about him that that is a big part of what he does when he interacts with humanity. God does not act in a capricious manner with us. He is not unfair. He is no, he doesn't uh, have higher levels of respect for some people over the other. Uh, scripture says it, it by saying he is no respecter of persons. God, God only, is the one who can treat everyone with absolute equity and fairness and justice and righteousness. And this is the kind of righteousness that we are going to talk about that's involved in the breastplate of righteousness and wearing it. He, God, judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. God is the judge. He's a proper judge. He's the righteous judge. He's the true judge. He's the one with authority to judge. If there is anyone who can judge, it is God and God alone. We're even commanded not to be judgmental towards others and not to judge others in a manner that is unright and improper. And a lot of times when humans make the call, when humans make the judgment, when humans make the discernment, it's not truly righteous. It has to do with things, other things that don't have to do with what is right and proper. A good illustration of that right now is what's happening at Harvard University, where the president of Harvard University was found to have cheated on her papers, particularly her doctoral thesis that elevated her to the highest levels of academia and ultimately was used as a springboard to make her president of Harvard. But she cheated, it was unrighteous, and it wasn't upright. Now, we're not the ones to make the final judgment in that, but her uh, her college, her, 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 the board around her are going to judge her in that manner. And um, it wasn't a righteous action, and it's being met with high levels of sanction because righteousness and only righteousness is desirable. True righteousness, where people do the right thing in the right way for the right reasons. Now, this is a familiar prophecy about the Messiah uh, from Isaiah 9, verse 7. You guys should remember this because it was read, uh, I think, more than once uh, during our Christmas time of celebration and Advent. Of the increase of his, that's the Messiah's government, and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore. Notice justice and righteousness, and they're very, very often linked in the Old Testament, also along with equity. That means not, not everybody gets the same thing, but equally and properly distributed is the judgment. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this to bring justice and righteousness through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
So righteousness is also identified as being a critical component of how the Messiah is going to interact with humanity. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. One thing about righteousness, and I use this to stand in place for a lot of stuff that's in the Psalms, is that righteousness brings joy to the people of God. A righteous king, a righteous ruler, a righteous judge, all of these things are joyful and happy things. And when righteousness prevails in the world, we can't help but be happy because when we know that we're being treated righteously, when we know that only righteousness is the way, then we are secure, we are safe, we can live in peace and joy. And so the prophet Malachi suggests that uh, that relationship with God that we have will bring righteousness and heal the world, heal the land, and we will be joyful, leaping like calves from the stall. Now, I'm going to start off with a couple from the New Testament. And this one I preached on uh, when I started off with Matthew. This is, of course, in the Beatitudes. I'm going to give you two passages from the Beatitudes that mention righteousness. And if you remember uh, the teaching from that, this, this passage, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, is two parts. The blessed word really means to be congratulated, to be held in high esteem are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness is a high value in the kingdom, in the world today. It's something that all of the disciples of Christ, all the believers in God are to hunger and thirst for. We want to pursue righteousness. And pursuing righteousness is another theme that we see both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We want to have right living. And God, there's a promise that goes along with the, the hunger and thirst and the pursuit of righteousness that those who want it will be satisfied by receiving it. This is a promise from Christ. So righteousness is not something that's out of reach. Righteousness is a key cornerstone value of the kingdom. And it's not something for the end times. It's not something for after God is finished with the world and makes a new world. It is for right now. And pursuing that righteousness and upholding that righteousness and demonstrating that righteousness and living in that righteousness is all part of being disciples of Christ and following the way. Then Jesus says this just a few verses later, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Righteousness is not something the enemy is interested in. If anything, the enemy wants to destroy righteousness at every single turn because righteousness is like a bright light that shines on the actions of the enemy, shines on the ideas of the enemy, the philosophies of the enemy, the the ethics of the en enemy. Righteousness is this blazing hot bright light that shows in bright relief just how wrong, just how evil, just how demonic the enemies of God are. And so we are to expect persecution as we live as righteous people before God, as we, as we implore God to pass his righteousness to us, to give his righteousness to us, to protect us in righteousness, to, uh, to keep the righteousness of Christ with us, which comes through our salvation. And this is going to draw fire. Again, uh, the attack will come because we're living righteously, but the breastplate of righteousness is also our protection. Even as much as it will attract attacks from the enemy, it is a protection against those attacks. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This bookends the idea that we heard in the verse from Genesis about Abraham. Faith and righteousness are interlinked. Indeed, without faith, 
righteousness before God isn't even possible. And because righteousness can't really be earned, it can't be bought, it can't be traded for, uh, no amount of sacrifice, no amount of human effort can produce righteousness in us. Scripture says there is no one righteous, no, not one. The only thing that can give us access to the kind of righteousness we need to be in relationship with God and to eventually enter into his glory is the righteousness that comes from Christ, the righteousness he bestows on us when we live in faith that his sacrifice on the cross is sufficient to wipe out our sin debt and present us as righteous before God. This is how we have to live. And by the way, it doesn't say that the righteous shall be uh, resurrected by faith. The righteousness will have life in the future by faith. It, Paul says that living for God in the now is a faith-based thing that we must do. And it is something that we have to live by every day. So it's not just a future thing, it's a now thing. And that's why we need that righteousness and the breastplate of righteousness to protect us. Finally, I read, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. I think I might have one after this. Christ is our righteousness. We've gone from seeing righteousness as being uh, something that's a characteristic of God, something that God bestows, something that God declares on certain people in the Old Testament, to something that becomes available for everyone who is a believer, everyone who comes to faith in Christ. Righteousness moves from being for those who God has chosen or elected or had special relationships with in the Old Testament to becoming something that is available for every single person who believes. But you have to have that sincere belief and faith. Then the breastplate of righteousness is yours to wear. And Paul puts it this way, and be found in him, that is Christ, not having a righteousness of my own. This is so critical, friends. We don't make ourselves righteous. We can't do anything to become righteous. We can't do anything to become good. We don't have righteousness that comes from the law. There's no list we can check all the boxes of. There's no, there's no level to which we can drag ourselves by our own acts or our own works to become righteous. But he says, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Back to the same idea that we had in the very first verse. All of our righteousness and the righteousness that it will be our breastplate of righteousness depends entirely on our faith in Christ. So fundamentally, how righteousness works in the life of a believer and how the breastplate of righteousness works in our life is it's like it's a, like a breastplate because it protects our integrity. Without righteousness in our lives, imbued by God, but maintained by us constantly being in that relationship of confession and submission and being constantly sanctified through the work of the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves able to live a life of integrity that we couldn't do without Christ and without the Holy Spirit and without the Father God providing all that for us. We live righteously because God wills that we live righteously as as the followers of his son and as the ones who have received his sanctification and his salvation by believing in his death and glorious resurrection so it becomes a breastplate because it protects our integrity that that part that i talked about at the beginning that is the very core of us without it we are vulnerable to being destroyed. And that's why it's so important, because righteousness is critically important, and the breastplate of righteousness is critically important, because the enemy primarily attacks our integrity to disable us. A lot of people think that Satan's actions towards Christians have to do with physical things, and they, they think that it's more like what happened with Job. But really, all Satan wants to do is, is damage our integrity. He wants to 
get in under our skin. He wants to reveal our weaknesses. He wants us to fall to our weaknesses. And then he wants us to feel trapped because we don't believe that we can confess and repent and be restored. We He wants us to believe that all of those things really can't happen for us because we're not we're not good enough. These are the lies that he tells. These are the lies that we hear all the time from him. You're not good enough. Nobody's going to forgive you. That thing you did, you're never getting past that. And that's all to take away our integrity, which takes us out of the battle and puts us on the sidelines. That's not where we're supposed to be. So righteousness is something that is given to us by Christ, given to us by God, but it's also something that we help to maintain and wear. And like this breastplate here, I'm sure that the Roman soldier was responsible for looking over it every day, inspecting its joints, inspecting how it was put together, ensuring that it was its integrity was holding together, and doing whatever he had to to maintain its integrity, even if he had to go to others for help. And that's what we have to do. We have to be working on maintaining our integrity, especially by going to God and saying, what must I do to maintain my integrity with you? What do I have to confess? Do I have to make reparations? Do I have to offer forgiveness? How is it that I am to, sh to build up my faith in Christ to the level where my integrity for you, God, not for ourselves, for God, will be protected and maintained as we are involved in the Great Commission to spread the gospel and make disciples of every nation. So that takes us to the end of my uh, little talk on the uh, breastplate of righteousness. I think that gives you a really good idea of how Righteousness is seen in Scripture, used in Scripture, written about in Scripture, talked about. And I think it gives you a pretty good idea about why the breastplate of righteousness and being involved in maintaining that righteousness from our side by receiving what God has for us is so critical in this day. If you think about some of the great hits, I guess you could say, the difficulties, the, the damage that's been thrown at the church in our lifetime, a lot of it has to do with the damage of integrity of people who've been in leadership or other things. And first of all, we have to believe that that's not the end, that anyone can be forgiven, anyone can be restored, but better to be protected and not fall than to be careless and allow yourself to be taken out of the work that God has called us to. I pray this has been useful for you and that uh, it will help you as you are studying uh, through this passage and also as you're studying to be a disciple of Christ. And I look forward to uh, talking for you or with you, however this is working for you. I look forward to doing the one for tomorrow. Uh, and if you're down at the church tonight at 7 o'clock, I'll be there too even do more detailed discussion if you want. Until then, go in the grace and peace and power and might and protection of the Lord in his righteousness. Shalom.